done by 11, right? Yeah. The, the necessary stuff, the beginning, Francis already gone through that. Uh, this is my disclaimer. Uh, I'll be talking a lot about technologies, uh, which some of these are publicly traded companies. Uh, I have no equity in any of them. So I won't, if I, I won't endorse any of them. Uh, and uh, it's unfortunate I'm not allowed to have any equity in them. All right. So one of the things about we're going to be talking about in cancer genomics, clearly a lot of it centers around next-gen sequencing now. Um, I've been doing sequencing for about 20 years, starting out the good old days here of a, a uh, you know slab gel and radioactivity and just reading them. Uh, those are good old days. You could have a beer in the lab, no one cared. Uh, but then it, it got more and more automated, got through here. This is still a slab-based instrument, but it was uh, fluorescent dyes automatically tracking. And then it became a uh, removal of the gel. So the capillaries, uh, the machines evolved. And during the Human Genome Project, uh, when I was involved with that, you could fill rooms full of these things, so it's sort of linearly scalable, and do about 200 million bases a day. And of course, what we're really going to be talking about a lot in this course is the sequencing revolution that started around 2005 uh, with this instrument, and we'll talk about the instruments in a minute. But all of these instruments now uh, are commercially available, and uh, except this one's just about to come out. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, and this is a, so there's not a, just a, a revolution in, you know, one platform. It's huge amounts of data, as you'll see, but there's all sorts of different platforms coming up. So what are the advantages of next-gen sequencing? Well, obviously, you don't need subcloning. When we did the human genome, they were back clones that we were sequenced, and then each one of those was shotgunned into plasmids, and every one of those plasmids had to be prepped. So it, there's, as you'll see, there's a, you can make a bulk library. So make one library. We usually make two but uh, essentially one library and you can do all your sequencing. Uh, the amount of data that's being generated is vastly improved. It's uh, huge amounts coming out. And as you'll see, that uh, many of the applications now, there's an increased dynamic range that you can actually just count the sequences. So it's sort of unlimited dynamic range, really. The more sequence you do, the more you can count. Um, and there's also you can detect rare variants, which is very important for cancer, as you'll see, uh, by going sequencing very deep. Uh, it's been readily adapted to a variety of applications. Pretty much everything you can do in genomics, in, with DNA anyways, and RNA, has been ported over. So uh, their microarrays are still being used. Uh, they still have an important place. Uh, but every, every application that was done on a microarray or gel base has been ported over to uh, next-gen sequencing, as you'll see. Uh, and the cost has gone down. We'll talk about that. And it's, uh, as I always say, it's ridiculous amounts of data uh, per run, as you'll see. Uh, it puts huge, huge pressures on compute resources. So it really started in about 2005 with the launch of the 454 platform. Um, this is really the first uh, true next-gen, well, I'll, I'll put a caveat on that. I'll talk about one other. But it was really the first really uh, commercial one that you could stick in your lab. So we're going to go through a little bit how they work. I think it's important to know where the data come from if you're going to be working with the data. So uh, if you uh, are familiar with these, I apologize, but not everyone knows how these things work. So we'll just walk through it uh, briefly. Most of the platforms will start out by shearing up some DNA and putting on some sort of adapter which is specific to the platform you're going to be sequencing. And this uh, collection then of, of molecules that have adapters on them is called the library. In the, in the case of the 454, they use a process called emulsion PCR. And this is just an oil and water mix that you, uh, you generate. And in each one of the little water droplets in the oil, it's like a PCR reaction. So it's the equivalent of a PCR tube. There's a bead in there which is, has all of those on it are complementary to those adapters. And then by PCR, you essentially coat the entire bead to, with these, uh, with this molecule. So hopefully, in one of these droplets, you have one of these beads and one of these molecules, so you get the just one type being propagated across the surface of that bead. If you have two, then obviously you'll get a, a double signal, and that won't work. So some of these beads are, some of these droplets are empty. Some just have a piece of DNA. Some have a uh, one bead. Some have two. Uh, it's a Poisson distribution. In the case of the four five four, they use what, what was called a picoteter plate, and still do. This is a, a a bundle of capillaries, glass capillaries that are fused into a plate, and then that's cut, and then they acid etch it to make little wells in them. The, the coating on the, on the capillary is stronger than the glass itself. These beads fit into that little well. These are the beads that are coated with the DNA. Then all of the enzymes that you need are packed in in other beads, and this holds it all together. So you just uh, put it in the plate and centrifuge it, spin it down, put it on the instrument. This is an electron microgram of what it looks like. And with each one of these little uh, wells then, uh, you then do sequencing by synthesis, you anneal a primer, and then you add bases. And as the bases are ad added, there's a cascade, enzymatic cascade, with a light signal being released. 
So this is really cool. In 2005, you get a couple hundred thousand sequences out of about 100 bases in those days. Uh, this uh, it introduced a new type of data, so we had to get used to it. We were used to the capillary sequencers. We were looking at traces that we'll look at in a bit. Uh, but this is now what we call flow space. And each one of these, so in this one, there's no blocker on, the, it's not like a Sanger-based uh, sequencing where there's a blocker on the nucleotide that comes in. If you add, if there's three T's in a row or five T's in a row and you add T, then you'll get five T's put in you'll, and you'll get five times the signal, roughly. Uh, so each one of these is uh, flowing in a single nucleotide and then you see what base is added and by the height of the signal you can get an idea how many there are. Uh, it's fairly good up to about five and beyond that it's uh, not very very linear. It's one of its problems. But you can imagine though that we've been used to dealing with uh, traces forever and all of a sudden these kind of data are thrown at us. We had to, none of our tools worked. We had to reinvent all our tools. The next one that came on, along was the Selexa and here's where I, I said that there was a, an earlier version so uh, Link, th Link Therapeutics in California was really the first uh, next-gen sequencers. They, they didn't actually market anything like an instrument. They sold a service and they did something similar with the beads, uh, many beads, and, but they're very short sequences. And they were acquired by Selexa for some of their IP technology to become Selexa Inc. So these are really the first guys. So it's, it's good to mention, uh, mention them. The Selexa, when it came out, uh, this is a, the first Illumina version of it, but it's a little different. And it's on a microscope slide. And on that slide are, are mobilized oligos. So the same sort of process happens where you have a, uh, a library, which is your DNA strand with some adapters on it. It anneals to this and gets copied. And then you repeat this process. And so you can imagine that this fragment then goes over, finds another one, acts as a primer, goes back, and you end up with clusters. So this is cluster generation. Uh, and then the sequencing is done by sequencing by synthesis. And in this case, there is a blocker on, so you're adding one base at a time. So all four nucleotides are there. And uh, it's an image by a laser, and you can just read off the sequence. And uh, it came out in, in base space, really, so you could get bases out of it uh, where the intensity is, and you get some sort of quality of us. So this is a little easier data to work with, which is one of the reasons I think it, it took off. This is the inside of one of you. Never, this is one of the older versions of it, but if you've never seen one, it's really quite simple. This is a microscope slide. I think I've got one here somewhere. I'll start this one around. This is an Illumina slide. Never seen one. And you can tell that it looks like a microscope, and it's built from the parts of a microscope originally. Uh, this is just a microscope objective. This is the slide here. Uh, it has channels in it, as you'll see as it, as it comes around. Uh, each one of these channels is a separate uh, sequencing reaction, and then it just scans along and reads the image, uh, and all these little dots here are the clusters of DNA. Uh, the next version's evolved a little bit beyond that, but that's the, the basics of it. This is how the early instruments looked. Right on the heels of that, around 2007, uh, applied Biosystems came out with a solid system. Uh, this was a, similar to the other ones. You made a library. There was an emulsion PCR, so you did coat a bead with uh, DNA fragments. You treated those DNA fragments so they would stick to a slide, so it's like a hybrid of the two techniques. They were then deposited on a slide, uh, and each one of these beads then is imaged. The main difference came in that uh, they did their sequencing by ligation, so this is not a polymerase-based extension. Instead, they have, uh, we'll walk through in a minute, but they've got uh, uh, oligos here that are fluorescently labeled, and then they are ligated onto the, the growing template. So this is what the early version looked like. They had, uh, they were redundant here, and then they had uh, uh, dinucleotide in the middle, which is what is given its, its specificity. Now the interesting thing was is they would need uh, more dyes than they wanted to deal with to really uh, distinguish all of these 16 uh, different ones. So what they did instead was they did two base encoding. And so using only four colors, they, get, they represent all of these dinucleotides. But you can see that AA and uh, the, the CC and the GG are all blue in the TT, right? So they all look the same. So they had to deconvolute that. It was actually quite clever when they did this. And the way that that works is you do the transition. So you have AA, which was blue, right? And then the next one is uh, an AC transition, right? And you can walk your way through this. So that you can see from this, these data, you need to know the first base. There are, four, there are different uh, possible uh, solutions here because of this redundancy. So you need to know some of the first sequence. Uh, and what we did, we sequenced the first base was always an A. Uh, and, so, and you'll find out more. There, there's other ways around this now, too. But this, this was a very different way of sequencing. They're, what they claimed was the big advantage, so we call this color space. This, uh, so it came out in color space. So once again, none of our tools worked, right? So we had to start all over. So this is very difficult data to work with originally, 
Um, even the tools for, from applied biosystems were lagging. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that the solid uh, had a difficult launch to, before it uh, caught on a bit. But it had some advantages to this two-base encoding. So it was for SNP detection, for example, if this is the, the reference sequence and these are the other possibilities, you can see that you get very different signals out of it. Uh, and you can uh, walk through and, and look for errors. Oops, I thought I had one more slide in there, but I guess I don't. No. But one of the, the things that they, they were trying to uh, say was that it was more accurate because if you didn't get a correct transition from AA and the next base was, would be AC, right, these dinucleotide transitions, if you got something else like an AA and then TC, they would call that an error. And because of that, they said they were more accurate. Um, that's, that's somewhat debatable. But that was the idea behind it. So then came along the third generation sequencers, and that's kind of the era we're in now. Uh, the, the, the current, uh, I guess, the, there, there's the next generation, then there's the next next, or the third generation, or the G3. But uh, the, certainly the, the Illumina and the solid platforms are still uh, cranking along. But uh, most platforms on the horizon are, are single molecule. That's where they're trying to get to, single molecule sequencing platforms. And the potential uh, benefit of that is ease of sample prep, so you don't need to do any amplification. Uh, much less sequence bias, as we're seeing in some of the data. Uh, potentially longer reads, we'll talk about that. Um, possibly higher throughput, although initially they don't have that. Uh, and low cost per base. But they do have higher error rates, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Along with the next gen, or the second generation that came out, were the... Let's check my visual aids here. I'll hand out... This is actually a, not off the version I showed you, but this is uh, off a of solid. You can see it's, uh, it's off the new solids. I'll show you a picture of one of those in a minute. It's the same sort of thing. It's just like a, a microscope slide with channels in it, but it's a much bigger format. But around the same time, Helico's Biosciences is still in operation, but uh, not really a viable uh, company, a sequencing company at this point in time, uh, came out with a really what was sort of ahead of its time, I guess. This was uh, almost a, a third generation. It was a, a single molecule sequencer. It was quite big. We had one upstairs for a while. Uh, it weighs about a ton. Um, and on that, uh, they would they would attach a, a, a single molecule, single, and then they'd be able to detect that. And it, it had about 50 lanes, about one, to one or two million reads each, and they had about 25 bases. They had a 5% error rate, which was, uh, which was actually quite good for a single molecule sequencer, but uh, was um, a much higher error rate than the other platforms at the time. And it had trouble uh, catching on, partly because the, the read length was quite short. When the Selexa first came out, it was about 25 bases. Right now, you can do 150, but typically people do about 100. Uh, and so it took off very quickly. And also, the number of reads, uh, the other platforms outstripped it very quickly. But it was uh, supposedly good for RNA sequencing. It had less bias. Uh, but I think just didn't produce enough different data for, for it to catch on. It's still around, though. The one that came out most recently is the PacBio uh, uh, real-time sequencer. And this is a very interesting instrument. We have one upstairs if you want to come see it. Uh, this is a, uh, a substrate here with very small wells in it. These are uh, 21 zeptoliter wells, I think, or 7 zeptoliters, I think, uh, with a glass surface in the bottom. And the way it was described to me once is that if you think of your microwave and that little gridded uh, panel in the front of it so you can see your food cooking without cooking your face, uh, and the way that works is the microwaves are too large to actually exit out those holes. And it's the same idea here, that these, these are so small that the laser light it doesn't act, exit the hole, but it actually does... Uh, light up the bottom area here. And so if you attach a polymerase at the bottom, uh, you can interrogate that. Uh, and the way that works with a single polymerase in the bottom of the well is as your DNA template is coming through, all of these uh, nucleotides, all four there are there present at the same time, and they're going around and they're coming in and out of this little uh, area that's being interrogated. And that's this chattering background on the lower trace here. When the polymerase actually starts to incorporate one, it, ha it takes milliseconds for it to actually grab the nucleotide uh, incorporate it and cleave off the, the fluorescent uh, molecule which is on the phosphates. And during that time then you get a signal. This is a, an idealized trace here. Uh, so you get a signal that comes up and then when the, it clips it off the, the fluorescent part on the phosphates and it drifts away you go back to baseline and then the next base is incorporated. Uh, so that's supposedly how it works uh, and it, it works quite well. As you'll see, I'll show you some data in a minute. Um, the other thing you can do that's interesting about this platform, it's not a supported application but if you've read their publications you can put other things in here, like a reverse transcriptase they've done. Uh, you can put in here a, a, a polymerase and you, or a, a ribosome, and you can actually watch uh, proteins being made. Uh, so it's, it's actually uh, an interesting research uh, instrument as well as a sequencer. The advantage of it 
is that this is what you end up with is native DNA that's being made. And uh, there's really, you know, we could say right now it's about 2 KB reads, as you'll see. Uh, you can probably do 5 KB reads readily in the near future. There's really no reason you couldn't do 100 KB reads eventually. So all that is dependent on the detection, right? On the length? Yeah. So the the because of the single molecule, uh, as the uh, as each one's incorporated, the signals are the same. Really, it stays the same throughout. So there's no decay in signal, unlike the other platforms, which are um, because you do that, you're looking at a cluster or a bead that's coded in DNA. Any time that one of them is not extended properly, uh, then you start they start getting out of sync. And as those things get out of sync, then uh, because it's a population of molecules, then you start getting more and more noise in the background. Here you're looking at single events. Um, I guess I can talk now about some of the error rates. One of the errors that happens is that these are chemically made, these nucleotides with the fluoros on them. And if you can't make something that's 100%. So if you make one of these and it doesn't have a fluoro on it, it's incorporated, you won't see any signal at all. Right? And so it looks like a deletion. And I'll get into how we get around that in a minute. But uh, So the signal stays the same. What happens is the laser essentially, uh, as, as the inventor of the technology told me, is that it, the polymerase catches fire eventually and just dies. Uh, and so they're, they're, they think they know why and they're trying to work on that so that it uh, won't. But if the polymerase didn't burn out by the laser, it would just go as long as the polymerase normally does, which is probably in the range of 100 kV for this polymerase. Right? So and the signal would remain constant. One of the, the most recent ones is the ion torrent. And I'll talk about this. This is a, actually a fairly interesting uh, instrument. Uh, it was sort of, uh, it's called the personal, personal Genome Machine, PGM. Uh, and it's uh, it's was sold as sort of a, a relatively low cost. So it's about uh, roughly about a hundred thousand by the time you buy everything you need to run it, uh, compared to the other instruments which are more like uh, six hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, these are the specs that uh, this is just off their website. This this three fourteen chip is currently available. Three sixteen I think is just becoming available, um, uh, and the three eighteen is not yet available. But these are the specs that they give out. Uh, the, the, on all the slides, you'll find the website of these places uh, if you want to go and look up more information. But it's quite interesting in how it works. So this is, I'll start passing one around. This is one of the chips from it. It's, it's a really, really clever idea. Uh, it's essentially, the machine is a giant pH meter. It's, it's a silicon wafer, as you'll see coming around. Uh, that is the sequencing surface right there. Uh, it has a, an array of essentially pH meters and little tiny wells here. And what happens in each one of those wells is as nucleotides are incorporated, hydrogen ions are released. And they draw this as it's sort of a single molecule. This is not a single molecule sequencer. Uh, this obviously is the signal of a single hydrogen ion would not be very strong. So this involves an emulsion PCR step. So you have a bead that's coated in DNA. And as the nucleotides are incorporated, hydrogen is released and you get a signal. And it's also an instrument where uh, if there's multiple bases incorporated, you'll get more uh, twice the signal. So it's interesting, a really interesting concept. Um, it's completely native nucleotides that are being incorporated. So there's no modification here. So you don't have to worry about floors, et cetera. So uh, it uh, remains to be seen exactly where this platform will go. This is a run we did just recently, um, just to give you an idea of sort of the metrics it can produce. So we got about 20 megs of, of data produced. But if these are the quality measures of Q17 and Q20. You can see it drops down, so the, the quality uh, after about 50 bases uh, declines quite rapidly, uh, but it's getting it's improving. Um, right now, they're about 100 base pairs long. I mean, it's a little like, bigger, probably the average is the uh, mean one. This one, the longest shoot is 126. I think the last re run we just did was 106 base pairs. Um, so it has potential. Uh, they they are saying that they're claiming that they'll get 400 bases uh, in about a year uh, and uh, produce uh, many many. So as the chips go up, as you see on that other slide. The, the total capacity will go up very rapidly. So this one has uh, an interesting one to watch, I think. And just on the horizon, uh, MySeq, which is sort of the mini HiSeq uh, from Illumina, it's like a single lane um, HiSeq in some respects. Mm -hmm. uh, the chemistries are very similar. Uh, the throughput's a lot less. These are the throughputs again. This is off their website of what it's supposed to produce when it arrives. Uh, they should be doing early access in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've got one coming in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then this instrument, the nice thing about it is uh, fast turnaround time, but you're paying the price of less data coming out, but there's many applications you'll see that that's quite good for. 
So what, what does this all mean? Uh, just to put it in perspective, sometimes these numbers are hard to figure out. So I was uh, co-director of the WashU Genome Center during the Human Genome Project. That's so much younger and slimmer me right there. Uh, and then after that, I went to the Baylor College of Medicine uh, for four years. And at the height of, the, of their capacity on just the old-fashioned uh, capillary sequencers, those two places combined to do about 10 million reads uh, a month or about 5 billion bases. And that's really the equivalent. Now, I have to update this slide all the time. I think it's fairly accurate. But the, just the number of bases produced per month is, about, is over 300 times from a single machine of what the entire output of those two centers was. So that just helps put it in perspective. And what does that mean? That's meant uh, declining costs very rapidly. Uh, in 2005, when they first came out, they were around uh, $10 million to do a genome. Uh, but the, you always hear about the $1,000 genome. I'm sure you've seen many articles on that. And what's often forgotten is the cost of the rest of it. So it's declining. This is reagents only. It's declining quite rapidly. Uh, this year we'll be in about you know, we're in about the five thousand dollar range for a genome for reagents. But what's never in, uh, put into that cost? There are all these other things. There's just getting the sample itself is exp is expensive. Prepping the sample, the equipment itself, the amortization of the equipment, the maintenance agreements. Maintenance agreement on on some of these big instruments is around seventy five thousand dollars a year. Uh, the personnel to run it, uh, the interpretation informatics, this is a big one. So right now it's probably more like thirty or forty thousand dollars for a genome to be fully analyzed. And what you learn about today is how to do this better so we can reduce the cost there. The whole week, yes, yes. Uh, and that, what's the trend then? We've talked a little bit about the 2005-2010 era. It was really an arms race, uh, largely between Illumina and AB. Uh, with 454 hanging on to its, uh, its uh, niche area. Um, and there was a, basically it was to produce more reads, longer reads, and get higher throughput at lower cost. And this year, we're seeing a, a broader application in many ways. So there's moderate throughput, there's ones with faster rot in time, high accuracy, they're, they're trying that, the new solids, uh, trying to get uh, even higher accuracy. Uh, single molecule detection is becoming quite big, and many of the new platforms that I know that aren't commercial yet are single molecule. Uh, we're seeing a launch of several new ones this year, and the, certainly the heavy guns are still being developed. So the AB 5500XL, which we have upstairs, and the HiSeq 2000 uh, is going up tremendously. The applications, like I said, is pretty much everything you can think of has been ported over. Obviously, whole genome sequencing is quite doable on these instruments now. Uh, we'll talk a bit about targeted genomic sequencing. But there's structural variations, SNP and indel discovery, copy number, whole transcriptome. We'll talk about these small RNAs, so like microRNAs, uh, epigenomics as well. All of these have been ported over to the to the next gen platform. <laughs> this was uh, this is a, more of a historic slide. This was the first cancer genome sequence, 2008. Um, but it's useful to look at because it, it the numbers haven't changed that much. I need my glasses to read it though. So when you sequence any, any genome, this is whole genome sequence, if you sequence any person's genome and you compare it to the reference genome, you'll find somewhere around two and a half to three million single nucleotide variants. Uh, they were after, this is cancer, so they want the somatic, they want the tumor sp uh, specific ones, and so they uh, threw away all the, the, these would just be basic polymorphisms from in an individual. Um, they found that half of those were in dbSNP, or in the Watson inventor sequences, the whole genome sequences. Uh, we'll talk a bit about why that was in this time. This is, uh, remember, this is 2008. Uh, left them with about 30,000 novel single nucleotide variants. Typical for then and even now, even when. You have a question? Okay, so the germline is uh, what's in your DNA from uh, your folks. So this is uh, what was in the egg when, when you developed. Uh, and then the somatic variants are ones that arose, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but ones that arose. Uh, during tumor front formation, so they're they're not uh, you didn't inherit those; those are changes that uh, occurred afterwards. Um, where was it? So uh, so typical at the time, and I think even today you see a lot of whole genome sequences out there, but no one knows what to do with most of the sequence. We don't know how to interpret it, so they looked at just the genes. Right? So they just looked at the genic regions. Uh, they found 11,000 there, and you can just follow this down or how they they got rid of them. They figured the synonymous ones weren't important, so they looked for the non-synonymous, and then they did some validation. Uh, they, the, the false, yeah, what? Oh, synonymous is uh, the, the change the, the nucleotide sequence but doesn't change the amino acid sequence. Non-synonymous means it changes the protein sequence. 
So they figured these were probably unlikely to be uh, important. Uh, that's not always true, but uh, you know, when you're trying to get down to something you can, you tractable, you can analyze. They're throwing out ones that didn't change the protein sequence, figuring that uh, that didn't matter. Uh, they got down. You can see the false positive rate was incredibly high here. Uh, not bad for the time. Uh, we're trying to do much better than that now. Um, but uh, we'll talk about some of the sources of the false positive. But they boiled down to that. after sequencing the entire genome, it got down to they had eight validated uh, SNVs. Uh, and I think there were a couple um, uh, deletions as well. But they boiled it all down to about 10 changes that they found. But they were able to identify uh, in FLT3 and NPM1 and find some interesting things. But that was the very first uh, cancer genome that was sequenced. And around the same time, uh, structural variants, uh, we'll talk about how those are detected, but uh, Campbell et al., they, they did two lung cancer cell lines uh, using paradigm sequence that we'll talk about. Uh, and they found in 306 germline structural variants, so these are just uh, structural variants compared to the reference that are in the, in the people in their normal DNA. And they also found 103 somatic rearrangements. Uh, 22 of them were interchromosomal, so 22 of them were translocations within the tumors, the two tumors that they sequenced. And they saw a lot of copy number variation in the tumors as well. At that time, they get about 30 kb resolution, um, which isn't great, really. You can do better with uh, microarrays. <coughs> but uh, as the amount of sequence you can generate has gone up, uh, you can probably get down to about 5 kb resolution very easily. So structural variants. It's important, I think, to, to understand the difference between paired ends and mate pairs. So all the libraries that I started talking about is you take the genomic DNA and you fragment and shear it up. And then the paired end, you usually shear it to around two to 500 base pairs, depending on the platform. You add your adapters to make your library, and then you'll sequence that. So you're just sequencing both ends of the same fragment. In a mate pair, you actually fragment uh, to a larger size, maybe one to 20 kb if you're feeling like you're lucky. Uh, and then uh, you circularize that, uh, sometimes around adapter. This is just one way of doing it, sometimes not around adapter, but you make a circle out of it. You then shear that uh, and then capture this part here, which has the, the two ends that were brought together, and you sequence that. So you're actually sequencing two pieces of DNA then that are whatever your average fragment size, like 20 kb apart. So you're getting those two uh, in, in one single sequencer. So opposite. Yeah, they will be. Depending how you sequence them, but yeah, typically. So what are you looking for in that? If, if this is a library, and these are all the fragments in a library, they will follow some sort of Poisson distribution. You can't. I had an informatics person ask me once if, if I could make all my fragments exactly the same size, and it would make life easier, and I just told him that I didn't need him if I could do that, because it would be very easy to detect uh, variation, right? So this is, it's more of a distribution. We're getting better at making it very tight, but it's still going to be plus or minus something. And what you're interested in is these extremes out here, the ones that are, are very much too big and very much too small. And if this is the, the, sequ the genome that you're sequencing on the top here, and you derive some, some paired ends or mate pairs like this, and then you map them to the reference genome, and they're too far apart, so they're in this part here. Uh, they're much further apart than you would expect uh, by chance, and you're looking for clusters of them, a single one you're not going to worry about. Uh, but if you see a number of them, then uh, it would indicate that in the, the genome you sequenced that there was something missing. So this was shorter than in the reference, so there'd be a deletion. Uh, and you can go through and you can see that uh, by looking at them, these are the normal concordancy. You get insertions, deletions, inversions, where they're in the, the opposite orientation they should be, or translocation across two different chromosomes. So translocations you would think would be the easiest thing to find because you're just looking for one, two reads or a read that, were, that are paired that go to opposite chromosomes. Uh, and uh, it actually isn't that easy. We, we thought it would be easy. Um, but there's a lot of background. And the background comes, so here's one, for example, there are three reads that, uh, this is real data, there are three reads that indicate that there might be a translocation between here and here. Right? Cause there, but if you look all over the place, there's, rough, there's lots of places that there's three reads or so. Uh, and these are just chimera clones that were made during the library construction. We're getting better at that, um, but it's not unusual to see in the neighborhood of 1% uh, of your fragments are actually chimeric. So they they're brought two pieces of DNA together that didn't belong when you did the, the cloning. Uh, so in this case, we were looking for one, and there were 14 of them that actually supported this translocation that was a real translocation. But it was really hard. We knew that because we were seeking something we already knew about, um, so we could spot it. But, you know, this, it wasn't 14 and then all the rest were three. There was some at 13, there were some, there was actually some at 18 that weren't translocations. 
So uh, we, we had to work on that, but that's that's the idea behind it. But it's uh, and there's several software packages that, uh, and you'll be talking about structural rearrangements you know, over the course. But uh, it's not easy. So another example here. This is a little more recent one. Uh, sticking with cancer here. This is uh, from the Wash U group, and it was a cryptic fusion. So this was a, a patient that came in with acute uh, promyelocytic leukemia (APL). 90% uh, of these are associated with a gene fusion between uh, PML and the retinoic, retinoic acid receptor alpha. Uh, and it's important that they get a rapid diagnosis of this because there's a very cheap drug, all trans retinoic acid, that you can add to the chemotherapy and it has a dramatic change in the outcome of the prognosis for this individual. That it goes from five year MET3 sort of recurrence of 69%, drops down to 29%. So obviously, if your patient can benefit from this, you, you want to give it to them. So this was a 39-year-old patient uh, who came in and had a remission, and they were considering a complete stem cell transplantation. So this is, a, this is actually a, one of these situations where you're trying not to kill the patient with the cure. Um, they, uh, they ablate the, the bone marrow and then replace the bone marrow, but for the, a period of time, then, of course, you have no uh, defenses at all. Uh, and so they sort of seal you up in a room and, and uh, try not to get you infected. So the, the site of genetics, or, you know, looking down the microscope at the chromosomes, had a poor prognosis and they did not see this fusion. So typically they would see the, an actual translocation uh, between two chromosomes and that's uh, in 90% of the cases. But they were pretty cons consistent with the APL diagnosis. They just looked at the morphology of the cells. And they were, weren't sure what to do. Should they treat this as an APL or an AML with a poor prognosis? So they did a whole genome sequencing of this. Uh, and they, in doing that, they, they sequenced everything, did the analysis, looked for uh, aberrant uh, paired ends and mate pairs to try and see what was going on, looking for translocations. And what they did find was a 77 kb insertion from chromosome 15 into the second intron of the retinoic acid receptor. And it, this resulted in the classic PML uh, RAR uh, fusion. It took them about seven weeks to do, which is relatively rapid, but uh, for diagnostic purposes, a little slow. But it cost about $40,000 is what they say in the paper to do this analysis. And uh, that's probably, I think, an underestimation because uh, the that's, that's fairly fully loaded. Wash U, we were quite good at uh, coming up with our exact cost. So that's the reagents, that's the machine, that's the keeping the lights on, that's the people. But there's probably a lot of experts, uh, you know, uh, people's time involved that might bump that up a bit. But they were able to give the, the patient then the ATRA, and, and the person at this time of the publication was in remission at 15 months. And this is just the region. So there's the two regions in question in the normal genome, and they had instead this uh, insertion and which ended up with this fusion, the classic fusion. So during the, the course here, so this did a whole genome to come up with this, this answer, uh, and we're able to give the patient the drug and, and get a response. Um, but during this course, maybe uh, if you think about, uh, as you learn more about uh, ways of analyzing this, is there, where there have been other ways to do this? And uh, we can talk about that later. I'm not going to give the answers. All right, so transcriptome analysis. Well, we all know that uh, DNA makes RNA, and uh, you get uh, the exons being spliced together to make the, the complete form. And they can be spliced together in different ways to get different isoforms, right? So microarray was the typical way of looking at expression. And microarrays are great, but they're only as good as what you put on them. So you have to know what, you have to put down your probes. And so if this, let's say, exon 3 here was one that wasn't known at the time, it wouldn't be on your microarray and you would miss it. SAGE, or SEER analysis of gene expression, was another technique that came out, but it relied on capturing the three prime ends, or the five prime, uh, and uh, would only then really, it, it, all of these isoforms would look the same. Uh, TACMAN assay is uh, similar to microarrays in that uh, it's a very good uh, method for getting precise quantification. Uh, it's fairly low throughput, though, compared to a micro microarray, you can at least look at the whole genome here, it would be very difficult. But again, you have to decide on what you're looking at, and you have to make an assay for each one. And of course, sequence then can cover the whole thing. And with the paired in information, you can actually uh, find reads then that connect to exons, and you can get uh, a little more information about the isoforms. So microarrays is still a good method. Uh, and this is the classic microarray exper experiment. But uh, you can just shunt this off at the RNA stage, prep it up in a library, and sequence it on, on either the Illumina or uh, any platform. And what you get out of that is a, really a digital count. So you map these back to the genome and these sequences, and, or to the ref, or to RefSeq, if you'd like, the reference uh, uh, RNA uh, sequences. 
And uh, by doing so, then you can just count them. How many times did I see this? And so because of that, you get a really digital output compared to an analog signal here. And the problem with microarrays is you can saturate them very easily, so they, you'll get a signal to a certain point, and then it'll, it'll plateau off. So you have a much greater dynamic range, essentially unlimited, uh, as, as long as you just keep sequencing, you'll get more data out to a point. Uh, and the libraries themselves uh, have biases in them and become saturated themselves. But if the light, in a perfect library, you can just go as deep as you want. So the, the methods are very easy. So you can take your, uh, you extract your total RNA. Uh, you have to deal with ribosomal RNA, which is like 95% of the RNA. So you get, you'll, uh, one of the things that we try very hard to do is, is decrease the amount of ribosomal RNA so that 95% of our sequences aren't what we don't want. Uh, there's different ways of making the libraries. I won't go into them, but essentially one way is make a cDNA library, uh, shear it up, and then it just becomes DNA sequencing. MicroRNAs, you can uh, get that fraction out, <clears throat> do a size selection and sequence that as well. So the transcriptome sequencing, you can get a lot more information than the potentially from the microwave as well. So you not only get the transcript profile, but you can get differential splicing out. Uh, you can get that uh, on a microwave depending on how you set it up. Uh, you can get differential allylic expression, so you can actually look for variants within the sequence and see which ones are expressed. Much more difficult to do on a microwave. Uh, RNA editing, uh, there's some recent papers saying, showing that that's actually a significant effect uh, where if you've got the genome sequence and you look at the RNA, they're different at a, a nucleotide. And actually, uh, the, some recent papers showed that the proteins are actually being made. So it's not the, well, the protein which is predicted from the DNA is not necessarily what's made. So that's a, another, yet another layer of complexity of the genome. And I've already talked about digital versus analog. And then smart, small RNA sequencing, obviously, uh, with the capacity of the instruments now, you can get uh, tons of small RNAs uh, from many samples into one lane, so you have to do a lot of barcoding. And this is where you put on a, a DNA sequence that you can read uh, and indicate where the sample came from. So just an example is going back again to 2008. This was actually the very first uh, microRNA experiment we ever did here. Uh, there was a paper that came out in June 2007. They had cloned and sequenced 330,000 small RNA sequences from 250 libraries, so individually cloning and sequencing. Huge amount of work. Um, they did 1,300 clones from each library, 20 different organ systems. It's a great paper. 700 microRNA were observed, and uh, they had seen 100 of them in MCF7, which is a breast cancer cell line. So we were interested to use that, that same cell line to see what we could see. And this is, the, this is their data here, showing the, uh, the, the relative abundance of the microRNAs that they detected. You can see up here, they, they had uh, 795 reads out of MC, MCF7. Our very first one we ever did, we got 4.6 million reads. Uh, they found 100, we found 213 of them. Uh, so some of them are quite, quite rare. There were 19 that they found that we didn't find, but if you look at the counts, there were 12 of them that had a single count, right? So, and it's also, you know, when you do different culturing, uh, you can get different things expressed. So these are actually very rare and uh, potentially not even real. Um, but you could see that the, the expression levels were, I had to break this into several different uh, graphs here, uh, very, very increased dynamic range and uh, obviously a, a huge number more that were found. So this is the very first attempt we ever did. We were able to, to map those uh, to the genome and uh, you can see the, the amount of resolution you get out. So what I've plotted here, and uh, you'll be doing some of this, is I plot the start point of the microRNA. And, and you can see that there are two peaks at this one. So I turned on one of the tracks in the browser, and sure enough, it was a microRNA, so that was uh, satisfying to see. But it's interesting that there are two peaks here. And uh, there's a, in a microRNA, there's a major, and there's also sometimes a minor one. So this is the two, the major and the minor. And another thing that's interesting, you can see that these peaks don't, it doesn't always start at the same place. Uh, and actually, that little trough in there, that's where the one in the, in the mRNA database, MERBase, that's the one that was in there. And yet, it doesn't seem to be, even be the predominant signal. We saw more often it started at the next base over or this one. And, uh, you know, what is the significance of these, these different start points is uh, yet to really be determined. Epigenomics, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Histone modifications, methylation, what have you. In this case, this is histone modifications where you can uh, you uh, take and you, you cross-link your uh, DNA to your proteins, uh, you, you fragment that, and then you isolate using an antibody directed at the methylated site of interest, uh, pull it down, get the DNA off, and sequence it. Uh, very nice genome-wide analysis, uh, and it's been shown quite well that it correlates with the expression studies. Again, you can just plot them onto the, the 
browser. Uh, and uh, this is just uh, K27 versus K4 in these cell lines under two different conditions. And again, you can just see that just by counting them, this is just uh, piling up here, and the, the y-axis is the number of times you saw it. You can see exactly where these things hit. So front-end technology. So one of the problems is that we're generating so much sequence now that I think it shifted the problem away from sequencing, which during the human genome we had to scale up how to, how to prep all those, those clones and how to sequence them all. Uh, so that was a, a, big, uh, a big endeavor. But now the sequencing has been shrunk down to a box. It's not trivial, but it, it's, it's taken away the pressure off of the sequencing in some respects. Um, but in where it's put it is on the front end and getting enough samples. We can generate so much material or so much sequence now from a single run. The, uh, the Illumina's upstairs, the high seeks are producing around 600 gigabases per run. So every 10 days, there's 600 gigabases. And you can divide that across a number of samples, depending on what you're sequencing. Uh, and you might want, right now we're for exomes, which is sequencing all of the coding part of the genome. We're putting three in a single lane, right? And there's, uh, there's 16 lanes on, on a, on a, so on a high seq So every 10 days you're doing 48 samples. So now you have to get all those samples into the front end. So we're working on automation for that right now. But the other end, and what you're dealing with this week is the back end. We're producing so much data you also have to analyze it, right? So it's putting the pressure in different places. For the front end, uh, we're, if you're doing targeted sequencing, I'm going to be talking about that in a little bit. One, of course, is due by PCR, um, and you can uh, either do an entire region, which we've done just by overlapping PCR products, and uh, Crystal did some of that on the retinal blastoma gene. And then, or you can do it for a candidate gene. You can take all of the, the isoforms and just develop primers for each one of the exons, and usually we do one. This is the so-called uh, you know, regulatory region, 1 kb upstream, uh, and then uh, sequence those. So there's been some uh, attempts at uh, doing that better. One is rain dance. Uh, again, we have one upstairs if you want to see it. Uh, this is an interesting technology they came up with. Uh, it's sort of a, in some respects, using the, like an emulsion PCR type uh, step. But what they did was you can make all the primers that you want, uh, individually synthesize them, and then put them in little droplets. This is a very stable emulsion. So they have a proprietary emulsion that is incredibly stable. These things will stay as an emulsion for a year. Uh, and they prep all these individually, and then they can pool them all together. And this is what this is your your primer library that you can buy from them. And then on the instrument, you feed in your your little droplets, and each one of these droplets has a specific one of these primers in it. Uh, and you also then take your genomic DNA, and it brings them together in little droplets. So there's oil in in the channel here. Each one of these droplets is where the the liquid is, the the water, uh, and they come down. And right here, a little electric pulse and it fuses them. And so now you have your DNA brought together with your primers, and all it does is spit them out into a PCR tube, uh, and then you can cycle that, and it becomes an emulsion PCR. So it's quite a clever idea. It's, uh, we haven't used it a lot, uh, partly because this step here of getting the primers made is relatively expensive, so it's not, it's not something you want to try something. It's something you know you want to work with. But we do have one upstairs. The other thing that came out was, was uh, other ways of capturing regions. and. Uh, in 1991, uh, Mike Lovett, and I was involved with this effort as well, did a, a it's really, a, it's not really a new technique, this is, a, and then it was called direct selection, uh, and that way we were after cDNAs, and we took cosmids, which were a very old cloning vector that probably no one has heard of, but we took cosmids that represented, represented all of chromosome 5, for example, we had mapped them, uh, and then uh, sheared those up and biotinylated them and use them to capture cDNAs. And so it's not really a new idea of going in and, and capturing out using a, a labeled piece of DNA to capture another piece of DNA. But now there's solid supports, Nimblegen and Roche, and, uh, and in-solution capture methods from Agilent, et cetera, where you can design oligos. Here's just showing an example on a solid support. You design an oligo specific to the region you want to capture. You make one of those DNA libraries, and you apply it to that, and you just pull down those strands, elute them, and sequence them. This is just an example. This, again, this is uh, quite old, but uh, doesn't change that much. This is a, across a region we were, we were trying, 600 KB region that we were trying to capture. The real gaps you see are where the, the sequence is too repetitive, like here. This is too repetitive to, uh, to design a, a unique probe to, so we left those out. Uh, each one of these lines here is, represents the probe. This is actually the TM of the probe being plotted here. And uh, this is the capture. And you can see that there are, it's not, uh, you don't get an even capture necessarily. Uh, you can see it's uh, somewhat profiles, or almost exactly profiles, the, the, the uh, TM of those, uh, of those oligos. 
but you can see even a single probe here can actually capture uh, quite effectively capture the region. Uh, it looks bimodal here uh, because you're sequencing in from both ends. Right? So you're capturing that middle part, but you're sequencing from both ends. And then more recently, the Agilent Sure Select is a, this is an in solution. The other one was a solid support. This is in solution. Just showing that you can direct uh, your, your probes to, uh, this is the kit gene, for example, and uh, you can get coverage of all of the exons quite nicely without uh, covering the, the uh, non-exonic parts. All right, so you've seen there's a lot of platforms and a lot of different applications. And so that brings up another area that's uh, a bit problematic, and that's pl platform complexity. We used to have a sort of a one-size-fits-all. Uh, most places were using the, the AB instruments or others that used other platforms, but the, most of the big centers had AB platforms. All the same, just filled a room full of them, uh, or several rooms full of them, and just ran them all the same. But now with all the different platforms that are currently available, you have to decide on uh, what you're going to run. So increasing these ones over on this side take longer to run, but they produce more data. And increasing runtime or increasing amount of data produced does cost. And they say sequencing is getting cheaper. The per base cost is getting cheaper. But as it takes longer to run, uh, there's different costs uh, models. So it increases, uh, you know, the amortization of the equipment. If you only can run the machine once a year, then uh, the cost, the entire cost of that instrument for that year is also borne on the cost of sequencing. Whereas some of these guys can run very quickly. The pack bio, for example, we'll talk about, but it, it can run a sample about every two hours, so can the, the so can this one, the uh, PGM. Uh, this is about five or six hour run. So they're, they're producing less data, but they're doing it much faster. Uh, so you have to decide on on what you what you want to do. You have to really ask the the, the research question, uh, and then apply it to the appropriate platform. Um, another problem it causes this is a very expensive equipment. Uh, so if you you know it's unlikely you're going to have all of these in your your shop. We we we're fortunate we do have quite a few of these. Uh, but that causes problems in that each one of these, as you've seen, has slightly different library preps. Right? So you have to, you, you can't just make, you know, can't build a pipeline that's making just one library goes on all your platforms. And that's where the, a lot of the big centers uh, have gone. And they've, they've got a mix of these two platforms here, but they take the same library, so they're just cranking them through. So uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to having these, this platform complexity. So, Tom, can you just sort of take a survey? Who works with high? Yeah, no, they, st they still have their place, um, but I think that I think that they are becoming the microarrays are becoming displaced, but they're not displaced yet. Right? And a lot of it has to do with what you, what question you. you know, people always ask me, you know, what what platform should I use? What sequencer should I get? Or what this and that? And it totally depends on the experiment. You have to really do the experimental design and then think about the appropriate platform. If you know, if you're looking at uh, expression and you know the set of genes you want to look at and they're well characterized then you can crank through a lot of samples on a microarray very readily. If you want to learn more about differential splicing and things like that, then you're going to want to use a sequencing approach. So it depends what you want to do. So along with the, all these platforms, et cetera, comes data complexity. So not only mixing and matching microarray data with sequencing data, but even on the sequencing platforms, uh, there's tons of data being produced. Uh, so huge amounts of data. We're stressing compute storage. Uh, and then the complex analyses, even just from RNA-seq, uh, there's all of these different things you can be looking for, fusion proteins, etc. Uh, and of course validation, we'll talk a bit about validation, or I really should say verification here. Um, if you want to, you've seen something, you want to make sure that it's real, uh, you're finding so much that now there's thousands of assays that need to be done. Gone are the days really of looking at one gene. This is what we have upstairs. Uh, you're welcome to come up and have a look. We don't have this one yet. It should be coming next week. That's the, My the MySeq. Uh, we still have Actually, three of this kind, but they're about to be converted to these kinds. 
uh, which is the high seek, so higher throughput. These are just being installed right now. I uh, haven't done much with them. Uh, and this is the pack bio, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Uh, our compute resources are listed here. Uh, it seems like a lot, but it's nowhere near what you need. Trust me. We're always you know, two and a half petabytes of storage, and we're always running out of space. All right, so on to cancer genomes, whether it's sequencing or however you want to do your analysis. So cancer is a disease of the genome, as we all know. Start out with a normal genome, norm, and normal germline uh, uh, mutation-free, essentially. Uh, and then what you see in, in, is in cancer is random DNA changes that occur, these systematic mutations. Uh, this may be in conjunction with some sort of uh, cellular defect it's in DNA repair, for example, so you're getting more and more or just, uh, just uh, wear and tear on the, on the genome as you, as you age. Uh, but what happens is you can have several different things that when you get a mutation, which actually is very deleterious to the cell, so swings it into apoptosis and the cell dies. You can have a mutation or a change that uh, we call a passive mutation. It really doesn't give any, confer any change to the cell whatsoever. It might even be in a, a gene that that cell is differentiated and doesn't use. Or you can have a driving mutation. And the driving mutations are ones that give it some sort of selective advantage. So the cell uh, will grow abnormally in its environment. And as it grows, it can accumulate more passengers. Uh, it can get new drivers and start growing uh, more aggressively. And eventually, uh, the genome can have lots of changes in it. So lots of copy number variation. Here's a very gross examples of copy number. There's extra chromosomes. There's actually pieces of chromosomes. Or you can have more just the point mutations or small indels. But the point is that when you end up with a tumor, you end up with a very uh, heterogeneous uh, population of cells with all sorts of different mutations in it. So a typical cancer genome project would be to get some tumor, get some blood for normal DNA or some adjacent tissue, if you like. Uh, you can sequence it, or you can uh, use some of the other techniques we just talked about, and really trying to identify the genome variants that are associated with the tumor that are, so they're somatic, they're in the tumor, but they're not in their germline DNA. And then on a larger population, you analyze the same things, and you're looking then for things that are statistically uh, sustainable uh, in, in doing pathway analysis, you'll be doing later in the week, uh, to find out pathways that are, seem to be hit more frequently in this population and those are the ones that you're going to go after. So an example of that is the International Cancer Genome Consortium, which started here in 2007. A lot of things happened in 2007 2008. Uh, we had a meeting that was held uh, right here, just uh, one floor below us. We had 22 countries, 120 participants. Um, there were a number of genome centers uh, represented and a lot of funders, which is very important as well, to come together. And the idea was to explore the possibility of doing a more of a coordinated effort, global effort, to study cancer. Uh, it was obviously a, a very large problem. So the rationale for it, it was it's huge. You know, obviously, it's, uh, it's bigger than the Human Genome Project, right? So this, this is best to spread it across countries. There's a lot of duplication of effort going on in the world, and if we could minimize some of that, I think we'd move things along. The one that excited me the most, really, was the standardization and uniform quality measures. So by doing this, it would make merging of data sets much easier uh, and uh, give us increasing power. So that, that was a, there's many studies where you, you download the data and it's in a different format uh, or in a different, different uh, you don't know, you know what percentage of them are real, for example. What is the validation rate, the verification rate? Um, there are lots of different cancers across the world, so some are, are more regional. Uh, and uh, we just wanted to accelerate the, the cooperation amongst, you know, sharing uh, method, methodologies as well. So. The, I, the basis behind this was to do 50 tumor types or subtypes. And to, the idea was to do 500 tumors and 500 controls per subtype. And this is the, the basic buy-in was that you would create a catalog of the genomic variants in those. And this is really like doing 50,000 human genome projects. Right? So it's a, it's a lot of work uh, that we were proposing to do. Uh, There's a paper that came out about it in 2010, just uh, sort of announcing it and saying what it was all about. But that was the basic premise behind it. Uh, these numbers come from... Uh, just a, a calculation that if you want to detect events uh, that are about in, in about 3%, so if you're looking at things in the heterogeneity that are in the level of 3% of the samples, you should be able to detect it with a 95% confidence. This is uh, slightly outdated now, but uh, pretty close. This is the, num the number of projects and the countries that are involved now in the, uh, in the ICGC. Uh, this is us here. We have a prostate uh, and a pancreatic sample. There's also another one, medulloblastoma, I think, that started. Uh, in BC, uh, but and that this is the efforts that were the 
TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas in the U.S., is, is part of the ICGC now. Um, I do want to point out that we're doing pancreatic, and I'll talk about this more, but Australia uh, also set up a, a pancreatic project, and so we're collaborating very closely with them uh, through this uh, ICGC. There's a website. You know you're real when you have a website. Francis had a lot of input into developing this website. I, got, I updated my slide just for you, Francis, so this is the new version. Um, uh, and on here you can yeah, on, on here you can go to each one of these uh, uh, places and you can see what the project is, find out all about who's doing it, etc. And I'm not I'm sure this will be talked about uh, by other people, so I'm just going to cover this very briefly. But uh, there is a, a website you can go to, a data portal, which is actually becoming quite good. Uh, and the idea is that uh, you can coordinate the data around the world. So you'll come to this one portal, which is actually housed here, and it'll you you will think that you're you're searching. Uh, uh, just locally, but you're actually searching the data across the world. And because of that uniform standards, then uh, the data are meshed together quite well. All right, so pancreatic cancer. Do we want to take a, like a two-minute break, or do you just want me to keep going? People, I think people are leaving if they have to go. Throw a hand so people want to take. The problem is when people leave, then you can take five minutes, and it's hard to get them back. It's like herding cats. Yeah, but if I know people have drunk a lot of coffee, may want to go to the bathroom. Do you, do you want to take a two-minute bathroom break, or people can just walk in and out? I don't mind that. Cause, okay, we'll just keep going then. All right. So pancreatic cancer. I'm going to talk about pancreatic, our pancreatic cancer project for a little bit here. Um, it has a five-year survival rate of 2%, which is about the worst for any cancer, is the worst for any cancer. Uh, it's only about 2% of new cases. But because of this, the survival rate is so poor, it actually accounts for 6% of cancer, cancer deaths. So it's the fourth leading cause of cancer death in either males or females and the fifth overall. Uh, it's very difficult to detect. It's highly metastatic and it doesn't respond well to treatment. And you can see here the new cases and deaths are pretty much equal. So why is that? So one is that screening, there's no, there's no early detection for pancreatic cancer. Uh, most patients are diagnosed with advanced disease. They, they come in, they, they uh, um, just don't feel well and it takes them all to figure out. But 60% of the patients that come through the door, it's already metastatic and they'll live three to six months. Uh, locally advanced, so it's uh, uh, in the pancreas and started to invade the other tissue around it at 25%, 8 to 12. And 15% have resectable disease, so you can actually surgically remove the pancreas. Uh, and they have a, a mean survival of 15 to 20 months, so overall 2% for five years. Um, and it, it's not uncommon where someone will come in, there was, I know of a case not too long ago that the person had a seizure. Uh, that was the first indication they had pancreatic cancer. And when they came in, uh, they had uh, uh, metastatic lesions in their brain already and they were dead within three weeks. So it's a very, very aggressive disease. So I, I talked about the front end. And the problems with that. So we, our goal is to sequence, uh, as an ICGC project, was to sequence 500 tumors and 500 controls. We've reduced that to 350 because Australia is also doing 350. So between us, we'll do 700. But uh, you have to come up with all those samples, and um, there's lots of issues with that. One is that in pancreatic cancer, as I said, only 15% are resected. So we're just looking at that. The you know reducing the number. It's not the most common cancer. Plus, only 15% we're getting the tumors out of at this point. Uh, so that's one issue. The other issue is that, um, and we'll talk a little more about this, about data uh, privacy, but we're generating so much data uh, on an individual, and we want to make it available to the world that uh, you have to take into consideration privacy concerns. So it, re it re requires a very specific informed consent the patient has to sign. Uh, and because of that, we had to start collecting real time in 2008, so we couldn't use any of the bank samples that people had. Uh, and most of those were FFP or formula fixed paraffin embedded. Uh, samples, which isn't uh, real, ideally what we want. We want we'd like fresh frozen if we can get them. So we had to reach out to other other places. So uh, we have some collaborators in Boston. Uh, we have uh, local collaborators, and also in Rochester, Minnesota, to help us collect samples. Uh, these three sites, as well, are creating xenografts, and this is where you're implanting the tumor into a mouse. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, so these three, we were very interested in collecting those as well. So these three centers are helping with that. But this is part of the the upfront infrastructure, not only processing the sample, but just getting the samples. So just an outline of the project. We get the samples, biobank them. We've got uh, germline DNA. Uh, we want to do all the things we've been talking about, and you'll be analyzing in the next few days. Uh, we're a se sequence-based uh, platform, largely, although we do uh, 
uh, copy number. Uh, we still do uh, an array-based uh, copy number. Well, we do a genotyping array, so we do a million uh, SNPs. Uh, from that, you can get copy number. We also use that to guide us in the sequencing to make sure that, uh, that when we know we're finished sequencing, we're able to detect uh, the majority of those. Uh, and then there's a lot of validation to go on. So what are the issues with primary tumor samples? Well, very seldom do you get a, a chunk of tumor that's 100% tumor. It'll have stromal contamination or normal tissue invading it. Uh, in pancreatic, it's 20 to 80 percent of it is tumor, and uh, it tends to be more in, at this end than that end, unfortunately. Uh, we talked about heterogeneity, so just in the, in the formation of the tumor, you have all those passenger mutations. You have a, a population of, of cells, not really uh, one population of cells. So you have to do a fairly deep analysis, and that's why sequencing is quite good for these analyses, is you can go quite deep into the sequence and, and find rare events. So that, that is a, a, an issue related to sensitivity. This is a pancreatic tumor. Uh, if you were to take a, a section of this, you can see that there's quite a bit of stroma, or normal tissue here. Uh, quotation is normal. It quite, quite often has passenger mutations in it. Uh, but if you take the bulk material here, because it's a mix and you're looking at a, a mutation, if uh, any regions that, are, that, have, uh, that you've had a, a copy number change to 3N, uh, your signal now goes to 33%. And if you look at even something that's essentially a diploid genome, but only 20% of its tumor, Clearly, then only your signals that you're looking for are only 10%. So only 10% of the sequence reads will actually contain that. You can see that in a microarray base, then uh, your normal is going to swamp out your uh, your signal that you're looking for. So this is the sensitivity issue. The other is specificity. Rough, it depends on the tumor type, but there are roughly uh, one somatic mutation per megabase in the genome. Uh, if we wanted, we one of the objectives of the ICGC is to have a 95% verification rate. So of the, of the ones we put in the database, we'd like that if you were to take them, 100 of them, 95 of them would turn out to be real or better. Uh, to achieve that, we really need a very low error rate per megabase, which is difficult to achieve. Um, but fortunately, um, most of the regions of the genome behave themselves, and most of the problems we see are occurring uh, in specific regions. We're starting to recognize this. And there's two main sources of that error. One is uh, uh, sequence error uh, itself, just in the, in the platforms. Um, although it's, it's not entirely random, but uh, uh, you hope that you get enough uh, correct reads that, uh, that would swamp that out. But uh, occasionally the sequence, uh, the errors can accumulate enough that you might uh, think that it's actually real, uh, especially if it's in the tumor but not the germline. Mm -hmm. But uh, another one problem that we've seen quite a bit is that you get a correct base call in the tumor, but you miss the call in the, in the germline. So you, you're considering it a somatic event, but it's actually just a germline event. Uh, and this is frequently due to insufficient coverage. Uh, the sort of the rule of thumb has been that to sequence the normal genome to 35-fold coverage and the tumor to about 50-fold coverage. Uh, and I think those numbers are a little low now that you probably, even just the normal, need to go to 50x. But it's been a major problem uh, because of the high rate of SNPs. So there's so many germline SNPs, and, these, and many of them, as we said before, are rare and, and to that individual. So you don't even see them in the, in the databases of SNPs. Uh, so you think it's a, it's a novel new mutation, but you missed it as just a novel rare germline mutation. So if you're interested in cancer, you have to deal with those. We're getting better at that. So there's ways of dealing with the tumors. Uh, one is enrich enrichment through chorine. So this is a pancreatic sample here in the OCT medium. Um, and it's uh, just frozen. And you can take a slice and stain it. And then with that stained slice, you can uh, align it. and take a, basically a biopsy punch and punch out where you think the most tumor is. And that works reasonably well. It's fairly labor intensive, as you can imagine. The other thing that we did in this project is, we're, like I said, we're generating xenografts. So a piece of the primary tumor, before it's frozen or anything, it's just a fresh piece, is implanted into mice. And uh, not every time, but frequently, especially with pancreatic cancer, it grows up a tumor in the mouse. Uh, that can be propagated in the mice. Uh, you can also take that and uh, make a cell line, which turns out to be rather difficult, but we are getting a few cell lines out. So why use xenografts? One, as I said, is the, the low tumor cellularity or the, the low tumor content in some of the samples. Hopefully then that tumor grows up in the mouse and enriches for it. Um, and like I said, in pancreatic, we're lucky if we have 50% or so. It's probably an average for tumor content. Um, and then uh, you can also get more material then. You can propagate this in the mouse. You get more analyses. But also these mouse, uh, the xenograph mice are good models for drug development. So we have an OICR medicinal chemistry group and a selective therapies group who are very interested in, in the xenografts and the cell lines uh, as uh, models for testing with various drugs. 
And it's very powerful when we have the complete uh, characterization of the, the genome of those same models, then uh, we can know what drugs and pathways to hit. This is an example here, again, pancreatic uh, primary tumor. You can see it's the same one I showed you before, but you can see that there's a fairly low tumor content, lots of stroma, and the xenograft itself then has much more tumor content, still has a fair amount of stroma, as you'll see. So the first five we sequenced, we went quite deep in them. So uh, as you can see, uh, 30x coverage of the genome is around 90 gigabases. Uh, so we went quite deep on some of these, the early ones. And you can see that the amount, that when we align it to the human genome reference, was variable and quite low. Normally, we'd get uh, around 85 to 90 percent of the sequence was aligned to the genome. So here we got uh, a lot less. Well, the ob obvious answer for that is it's, uh, if you look at the amount of it by qPCR, we can make a few loci. Uh, then you can also estimate by sequence. But you can come up with the amount of human DNA in there and the amount of mouse DNA that's in this sample. And you can see it sort of reflects the amount that we get aligned, reflects the, the human content. So this one's quite low. So is this one. Right, as far as the amount of human material that's in there. So you can ask, you know, have we really traded one heterogeneity problem for another? Uh, we had human uh, stromal contamination before, now we have mouse stromal contamination. And it's a particularly a problem with the pancreatic samples. They just like to grow interdigitated. So what, is, what other problems can that, that have here? Here's an example of a, a somatic variant seen in one of our, our xenografts. Um, I've blown it up here. So it's quite, there's a lots of depth of coverage here, lots of reads. You can see that uh, the, there is a T in the reference sequence, and then occasionally we see a G. It's quite clean. You can see these are the errors here, but these are, it's quite clean sequence through here. Uh, and you want to call this a, a, T, a T to G variant in the, in the tumor. If you were to take that sequence around that, the 100 base pairs that, that, uh, that surround it, and blot it to both human and mouse, so align it to human and mouse, the only difference in that 100 bases is that T to G. So those reads that were looking like a, a SNP were actually the mouse reads contaminating the mouse DNA, and we call these interspecies SNPs. Uh, so obviously you want to be able to weed those out. Another way of doing uh, enrichment is through uh, antibody enrichment. So you can take the xenograft and you can dissociate it down to single cell, hopefully. Uh, use antibodies that are specific either to the mouse, which is a, will pull out the mouse part, or you can use them positive to some markers on your tumors and pull out the tumor part. And that, that works reasonably well. You can see here, this is actually a fairly good set of xenografts in that they started out, this is the non-enriched, the light blue. Uh, they started out, this one's rough, almost 60% of it is human. Uh, and some of these others were actually pretty high to start. But you can see that you can enrich, so this is post-enrichment, the amount of human DNA that's there. And this one got up to actually almost 100%. So that's going to help you. So of course, uh, we had to get rid of those mouse variants. Uh, so we had to stop and sequence mice. Didn't want to sequence more mice, but we had to. So we sequenced the two, two mice that, uh, that were the xenografts were made from, uh, aligned them to, to this is aligned to the, the mouse genome, uh, to get the number of variants to the mouse reference. But the real question is, is how much aligns to human for us? So these two samples were sequenced. And you can see roughly around, uh, you know, 0.6 to 1% of the, of the most reads aligned to the, the human genome. Uh, most of them are not, a fair number of them, a disproportionate number of them, aligned to the exome, the, ex, the coding part of the genome, which is only about 1, 1.5%. One and, and you can see a significant percentage of those align. If you were to align it to the human genome and just run it through your pipeline and call SNPs, uh, this is the number you'd find. So you can see that uh, we've got quite a few SNPs being called. And again, a disproportionate amount in the exome, which is the part we're most interested in. And if you, this is a circles plot, which you'll be hearing more about. But these are the chromosomes around the edge here. These red lines represent all of the SNPs that we detected if you just run it through the pipeline. And this inner circle is after you remove the ones that we know to be mouse. Uh, that, that's what's left. So these are, are things you have to deal with, especially if you're doing xenographs. But they are useful. So this is uh, some of the pancreatic samples we have. Um, these are the mutations that we found. These uh, uh, are frequently uh, KRAS mutations, uh, almost 100% almost of them. But you can see that here's the primary tumor. We sequenced it, and we did not see the KRAS mutation. Uh, it was in, if you went in and manually looked at it really closely, you'd see that uh, we only had 38 reads covering that in this particular sample. Only two of them were, uh, uh, showed the KRAS mutation, and they were sort of a low quality. But in the xenografts, we were readily able to detect that. Uh, another one here is 3 out of 227 reads. 
that detected it. So this was actually very poor cellularity. Uh, one out of 29. So you can see we did get a nice enrichment here. And in the cell lines, we got enrichment as well. So this is a mutational landscape. We're still validating this. This is uh, very new data. But um, if you looked at the, the samples we did, we did uh, 25 samples when this analysis, or 26 samples when this analysis was done. And this is the KRAS, which is almost all of them. You get suspicious, actually, when you don't see it. You go in and look really hard. Um, but then these other genes here, uh, there were about 300 genes that were in four or more of the samples. Right? So the, not the same mutation necessarily, but the gene itself being mutated. So that, was, that seems to be significant. Uh, but there's 2,200 more that were in one to three of the samples. And this is pretty typical for all the, the, the tumor projects that are going on. The, the recently published was the ovarian uh, project where this, instead of being KRAS, was uh, P53, but again, a very long tail like this. And the question now is trying to figure out uh, the significance of this long tail, uh, whether these are, how many of these are important, whether there's different subtypes. I'm sure there's subtypes of pancreatic cancer we just don't appreciate yet. Uh, we'll probably be able to start subtyping, subtyping those. We have them do a path pathway analysis and see how many of these might, uh, might fold into a pathway, and you'll be doing that over this course fold these into pathways and make a little more sense of it. But this is just the, the long tail that we see in all of these projects right now. Uh, I talked about verification. So it's very important that we verify these. This is just one quick snapshot. Um, we did this on the PAC bio, so I'll talk more about the PAC bio in a minute. Uh, the, if you do it just by Sanger sequence, and I'll show some examples. Again, these are the primary tumors that we're doing this validation on. We just selected a few randomly and uh, then made primers specific to that location and sequence them to see what they look like on the, uh, uh, see if we can identify it in the primary tumor. This is once we saw in the xenograft first. And you see it's 67% here, 83%, that was pretty good here. Uh, but on the pack bio where we can sequence deeper and, and see it more likely, we can see that the numbers go up. And just to show you some examples here, these are really hard to see because it's really hard to see. Uh, this is the, the reference. Sorry, this is, a, this, let me get this right here. This uh, is the primary tumor here, and this is the reference. And you can see there's a little tiny blip under there. That's actually the tumor portion in the primary. Uh, and you can see that there's a fair, this is a fairly clean trace, but there's another little blip here, which is just noise. So it's really hard to distinguish that from the background. Uh, this is another one. This is, uh, let's see, get this right here. This is a cell line derived from the, 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 the xenograph. And you can see it very clearly. You can see uh, both bases here. This is the primary tumor. Again, you can hardly see it in the primary. So the real question that's, that we're trying to identify and, and other people as well is, do the xenografts, how well do they represent the primary? They represent it fairly well, but how, you know, they're not exact copies of the, of the primary tumor. This uh, came out uh, in a Nature paper here, again from WashU, where they sequenced uh, a, this one was breast, I believe breast cancer that was a metastatic tumor, the primary tumor, and a xenograft derived. So we have the primary tumor here, the metastatic tumor here, and the xenograft. And one difference you can see right away is this uh, translocation here uh, is absent in the xenograft. So uh, for whatever reason, that cell was not selected uh, in growing up in the, in the, uh, in the, the xenograft itself, but was in the metastatic uh, tumor. What they found, and this is a data point of one, uh, so, but they did, it did seem to them that the, the, the copy number changes, uh, the new mutations, and overall that the, the xenograft seemed to look a little more like the metastatic lesion, which may not be that surprising since the, the xenograft is sort of a model of a, of a metastatic lesion. You, you've taken a piece of the tumor and you're growing it up in a new site. All right, so clinical applications. Excuse me. May I ask you a question sure. about the international transition? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's the standard of the sequencing for these old projects? Uh, is there a standard for the sequencing technology used? Or of which technology? No. Uh, no. No. It's different. Yeah. Whatever technology people want to use. So what platform is up to the up to the group? What the the standard that we're achieve, trying to achieve is that 95% of the things we put in the database will actually validate and be real. Okay. And uh, they extract both somatic DNA and germline DNA from the old. Cases and controls? Yes. And uh, what type of uh, variations are assessed in this project? You're going to be talking about that more depth, but the DCC or? I don't, yeah, not about validation. Yeah. 
What about what's, what's available in it and stuff? And, yeah, yeah. and how to search it and stuff? So we could defer that, but it, it's basically the, the, the basic premise of the ICGC is just to catalog sequence variants, so uh, single based uh, in deletions, insertions, or small insertion deletions, uh, and uh, uh, SNPs themselves. That's the, the minimal requirement. Uh, most people are including that structural variance, copy number variance. Um, there'll be uh, transcriptomes on some groups are doing transcriptomes, but and all the data we're putting in. And I don't know if France is going to talk about it or not, but there's two levels of access. Uh, the somatic variants are available freely to anyone who wants them. If you want the germline data because of uh, privacy concerns, you have to actually apply through the DCC and get a password. So I'm going to talk about clinical or personalized medicine for a little bit here. Uh, there's sort of a somewhat of a perfect storm, I guess, coming has come together in that um, you know somatic gene mutation, copy number variations are really the the best predictive biomarkers uh, for cancer treatment. Uh, the rapid advances in next gen sequencing and other technologies, uh, and they, there's huge numbers of drugs out there that are available um, to target these various uh, lesions. So. Uh, these things are coming together to make to the point now that I think personalized medicine has really become a reality. When I first came here in 2007, um, started talking to the clinicians about uh, doing this. Uh, this is the main reason I came here. Uh, and I, I felt the technology was ready. Maybe it wasn't quite in 2007, but it was clearly on the horizon. That was their first question. Is it really ready for clinical application? Um, can you use FFB? So F, a formal and fixed pair from embedded is the the standard for uh, diagnoses in the, the in pathology labs. Uh, this is where they the sample is taken and dropped into to formalin. It, it fixes the DNA, uh, so it destroys the DNA in many ways, which is bad for me. Uh, they then embed it in a waxy substance uh, for get nice. Uh, those images you saw were are little thin slices off of those blocks, uh, which are then stained. So it works well for them. Uh, we, we can do we can work with it, but we'd rather have the the fresh tumor. But uh, I think we're not going to change uh, the clinical practice, uh, so we we have to learn to work with FFP. The other thing is turnaround. If they re if they want uh, to use this information, they need it fast. They need it within a few weeks. Um, and then uh, I won't go through all these questions, but uh, there's the bioinformatics. How are we going to handle that? Uh, I'll talk about incidental findings in a minute. And uh, if you got any, you want more detail on any of these things, just come and ask me. So the clinical challenges. For up for me was to uh, these high throughput machines was to adapt them to an individual uh, diagnostic. Um, part of it is it's too much data generated right now. It's on the current platforms that we were using, and I said there's some new platforms coming to produce less data. But like the Illumina, uh, there's so much data being produced. You either have to run a single sample on one lane, which is costly, but if you want to pool samples, then you have to wait to get enough samples to run, and and that doesn't fit into that time course. Uh, but there are the new ones that are coming along. Um, again, too much time. And the other important thing is that you have to make sure that the, the data coming out of the platforms is actually uh, has some sort of validation that you know that the error rates of it all before they'll accept it. And there's two there's sort of different uh, mutations that we can find. There's the actual mutations. These are um, gene gene uh, changes that have potential impact on the treatment recommendations. So there may be a drug that actually would target that uh, that uh, gene or pathway. Um, and uh, for prognostic value. The druggable, of course, that's where you actually have something you can actually hit it with, and then just disease-associated ones that they uh, correlate them, and we'll talk about more about that. So some of the actual mutations in cancer. Uh, this is just a, a short list of genes here that are, are common ones. These are common mutations that recur in many, many different cancers, uh, and then the, the most common cancers that you see these in here. Uh, for example, BRAF mutations in uh, skin cancer and melanoma, and but the, what becoming more realized is that these are not these mutations are not specific to any cancer. Of course, so BRAF mutations are very pro 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 prevalent in uh, melanoma, but there also you see these same same uh, uh, BRAF mutations in non-small cell lung cancer, colorectal cancer, ovary or breast, and, and so the question is, you know. Can you can these people benefit from BRAF inhibitor? So as I said, the the workflow is changing. So this is this is where we've been since 2007, really, in that we've got these massive machines that can do whole genome or transcriptome or what have you, uh, and it's you know typically a couple months worth of analyses is far too long. 
But for, for this side here now, we're getting down where we can do this in the sequencing, certainly less than a week. And uh, I'll talk about this whole pipeline in a minute, but uh, this is really becoming a clinical reality on this side. So one of the questions we first said, these are, are real biopsies here. Uh, you know, can these biopsies be utilized? And so this is, uh, this is uh, the biopsy on a slide. The pathologist has circled where the, where the tumor is. And then this is a, a macro dissection. So this is just completely scraped off and DNA is extracted. And in most cases, we can get enough DNA to do our analysis. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the pack bio a little bit now. I think I have one left now. This is the, this is the what's called a smart cell. That's what the sequencing is done on a pack bio. I talked a little bit about the, how it works on that chip that's coming around. Uh, that's the single unit for sequencing. There's, oh, I forget how many, I think there's 300,000 of those little tiny welds that's on there. And if you look on the bottom side of it, you see a little pattern. That's the etching on the, in, the, in the whole thing. Uh, and it's, we've gone through how it works. But each one of those goes into this machine. Uh, you can load up to 96 at a time, at least eventually. Software won't support that right now. And uh, it'll uh, process them through one at a time and do the sequencing. So it has a very fairly simple sample preparation to do, so that's nice. Uh, it, right now it's producing reads roughly around 2 kV um, and probably going to go up in the, short, in the short term. About 85% accuracy. So 15% of the bases are wrong. Um, that sounds bad, but uh, in a long read, that's, that's okay. Uh, but in, in what we're trying to do, of course, we want better than that, but I'll show you how we do that. <laughs> Runtime's quite short. Once it's in full tilt, it can pr run, process a sample. Right now, actually, that's gone up a little bit, about an hour. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is circular consensus sequencing, which will come up in a couple slides. So just to give you an idea of the, you know, what it's like getting a new instrument. So we got one of the first ones. All right, we had actually machine number two that was shipped out from PacBio uh, a little over a year ago now. And this just shows you since uh, December of last year uh, the, the throughput. So this is number of mapped reads, number of, uh, of uh, bases that are mapped. And you can see that we came through, we were getting around, this, this is the number we were getting, we are getting around 20 uh, megs of data. They came out with a new enzyme, so all these companies are always uh, coming up with improvements. The, then we had the instrument upgrade, and you can see actually uh, things went down. <laughs> I wasn't too pleased with that, but that was uh, that the upgrades didn't go as quite as anticipated, so we worked our way through that. And then uh, we've been doing a lot of work on titrating uh, a lot of the processes, and you can see that it's been going up steadily. And uh, this just ends in June, and it's sort of plateauing out, but we're up, we've had runs up in the 140 megabase range now. Read length has been pretty consistent. So with the upgrade, we did get increased read length, but we got less yield was the problem here but we were able to keep the, the read length the same and increase the yield. These are run metrics from uh, sort of 10 runs from about, oh, probably about a month ago now. Uh, but just, oops, just to zoom in on uh, this little part here. Number of uh, post-filter reads, so these are the good reads. They're, again, about 76,000. Uh, we get a few more than that now. Uh, we get 63,000 of those that are actually mapped to our targets. Uh, the read length is a little under uh, 2 KB. Uh, number of maps, so this is 110 megs of data, um, and I've said we've seen, we typically get that uh, to 120, and we've seen some of the 140 megs, so we're getting quite a bit of data out of them. And uh, the mean mapped ac accuracy is staying the same, about 85, 86%. So circular consensus sequencing. So 85% accuracy doesn't sound very good. Uh, in a long read, that's not, that's not a big problem. Again, this is one of those situations where we have to reinvent our tools a little bit. Uh, to work with those types of data, but uh, that'll, that's coming. But what we're, we're doing with it right now is a, circular cons a lot of circular consensus work, and we're doing PCR products. So we're amplifying specifically uh, genes of interest to us, and we're amplifying the exons, and then we're pre prepping them in the library where you put on these hairpin adapters, and it makes then a, a closed circular uh, DNA, uh, single-stranded DNA uh, circle. Put a, a primer on that and a polymerase, that goes into that well, Right, and gets read. And what it does is it reads, it starts incorporating the nucleotides, making a, a strand of DNA, and it goes around this circle, just keeps going around and around and around, uh, and makes a, one long transcript that comes out. And this is the sequence that, that's coming out then as you, as you read it. And you can see it goes around, it goes through the adapter, goes through this, the reverse strand, the adapter goes through the forward strand. Uh, so you get multiple reads of that same template. And then we can use the informatics to clip out these subreads put them together and come up with a consensus. Because the errors that are, occur are largely random, 
then by reading that same template four or five times, uh, you can get a consensus sequence that's quite accurate. Is that what you're aiming for four or five times? Sorry? You're aiming for four or five times? Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. And most of our inserts are around 300 base pairs, and we are we're we're trying to figure out where where the cutoff can be. Um, we use three uh, frequently, but I seem to like five a little better if it's gone around five times. Uh, and as the read lengths increase, obviously we can increase our our amplicon size and also go around more times. The most time, the record I saw was it went around 32 times, um, which is a waste of a waste of time. But uh, in a typical run, this is again from about a month ago, but 64% uh, of the templates had three or more of the subreads. Uh, and you can see that some of them out here have gone around many, many times. And as that uh, consensus goes up, then you can just tell by the mappability that the accuracy is going up here. So we're getting an increasing amount that's uh, able to, of the reads that are able to map to the genome. And to put it sort of a visual basis here, this is the data, what the data look like with a consensus of one or more subreads. So uh, this is all the data, but including everything that maybe even just went went through once. And uh, you can see that uh, there are some uh, gaps in here. These are deletions. These are errors. These little purple things are insertions. If you make it a little more stringent, let's just say things that you saw three or more, you can see it starts cleaning up in five or more, so even a little cleaner. This, the major error that remains are these insertions. But overall, you can see they're random. Here's a couple that have been reproduced, but not at the level of the true variant here. So we had to uh, uh, validate that against the known platform. So in the, the diagnostic lab, we're not a CLIA lab, which is a, a certification. If you're going to be doing diagnostics, you have to have that. So we're, we're a research lab. So we want to compare ourselves to the CLIA lab. So they used a process called Sequinome, which is a, a platform that it's a genotyping platform. It's looking at specific variants in these genes. Um, it's a, it uses mass spec as the readout and the details, but it's, fair, it's quite accurate. Uh, and they validate it and know that it works quite well. So we compared on 30 samples that we got from them, uh, and these were DNA extracted from those slides as I showed you, and we compared to see what we would see. And you can see that uh, we, we, where they saw a mutation, we saw a mutation. We missed one. It was this one here. We didn't get that one. Uh, and that was actually um, a problem with this amplicon that uh, we have since fixed, so that we, we just missed it because of that. But uh, the, you know, we were able to detect them all, so we were pretty happy with that. You notice that the frequencies are a little different, uh, sometimes radically different. This is variant read frequency. The number of percentage of reads that showed the variant here. We saw an 8% of the reads by sequinome was 24%. Here's one that's fairly accurate. This one's a little lower. Uh, this one's about the same. So we're, we're not sure uh, why that is, whether the sequinome's off a little bit or whether we're off a little bit. Might just, this is probably just read depth as well. This is from a little while ago. And we, we were generating less data. So we've, we've actually launched on a, a program, a feasibility study, to see if we can do diagnostic sequencing. Uh, eligible patients come in. These are patients, these are advanced, uh, recurrent, or metastatic disease. So these are patients who have had cancer, been treated by the standard of care. You're not going to change the standard of care very readily. But they've uh, now come back, and they've, they're, they're either their cancer didn't respond to the standard of care, or now they have metastatic disease. And there are a lot of clinical trials going on across the street at Princess Margaret Hospital. And so the, they, they are potential candidates for, for these clinical trials. They often have to be able to have a, a biopsy done. So it, they have to be in uh, good enough health or have the accessibility of the tumor for a biopsy. Uh, and they, of course, have to have informed consent. Uh, we, we, our first patient came in in March 21st. Um, the idea is to get a fresh biopsy. We'll do the sequencing. The CAP CLIA lab and the diagnostic lab will do the sequinome, and then we'll compare the results. This is the, the flow. So this whole thing was our goal was to do this in three weeks. Uh, the patient is uh, consented. They have to do a biopsy. That can take up to about five days to get that booked. Uh, many, not, half of them are, are need a radiologist to come in. To, to, it's an image-guided biopsy, and half are just done uh, at the bedside. Um, they, get, they also collect blood. Those go to the pathology lab for a quick diagnosis, uh, mark out the tumor parts, goes to the CLIA lab to be the DNA to be extracted, and then some of that DNA is sent to us and we sequence it and do our informatics on it and compare our results. If we find something that, that, that's not one of those common mutations, then the, the CLIA lab will validate it uh, by Sanger in order to, uh, to you include it in the report, or it has to be communicated as just a research result. Uh, we generate a report, goes back to the clinician. 
just some examples. This was uh, patient one, a 50-year-old female, uh, mucoepidermoid uh, carcinoma of the lung. I won't go through all this, but an image was done. Was, uh, done. Um, the issue here was that we didn't get enough DNA. Enough DNA for the sequinome analysis. It needed, uh, needed around, uh, I've forgotten the amount it needed, but it's like 100 nanograms or something. And uh, there wasn't enough DNA for that. We actually uh, did a whole gene modification and sequenced on it and didn't find any mutations anyways. But uh, uh, so that was the first one. Uh, another one here, colorectal cancer. This one was a uh, person who had gone through their, their original uh, uh, treatment here. The mutation report, there was a PIK3CA mutation. We saw it on both of our platforms. There's no KRS mutation. Originally, it had a KRS mutation. Neither of us saw it. Um, so that it was a low, low level seen the first time. And uh, this one was considered actionable as, because of the PIK3 uh, uh, mutation. And that was done in, the, in the, the amount of time we wanted. And not just the last one here, 54 year old male, uh, colorectal cancer, KRS wild type. Uh, we saw the mutation, the KRS mutation. There was a germline METS uh, SNP. So this was a uh, non -syn or synonymous change in the a MET gene that we saw because we're sequencing the entire gene. They're just looking at specific ones. Uh, the significance of this, we have no idea. So this is in their germline DNA. So they were born with this, this variant, um, and we had no idea what that would be, but it was actionable because of the KRAS mutation. Just a summary of the first uh, uh, eight or nine, um, and you can see about half of them, we actually end up with uh, some kind of actionable mutation. And did we meet our benchmarks? This is, uh, we've actually have to patient 25 now. Uh, but on the first nine, the numbers are more or less holding the same. Is that uh, most cases we, we were there, we, uh, especially our, our timing in the, to get it under that three weeks, we're, we're doing pretty well on that. So the future challenges here, this gets back to that front end as well. So as we increase the number of genes, we're only looking at 19 genes here uh, at the moment. But we, we have a list of 200 that we want to look at, and we're expanding that up. To do a PCR on 19 genes isn't that bad, but as we expand it up uh, to 200 genes, we'll have to start looking at more of those capture technologies, um, and we're doing that right now. And it's unlikely that one technology is going to do it uh, completely here. We use uh, capture technologies for the research for the exome sequencing, uh, but we, we have some parts that don't capture well, and we just accept that. But in the clinical setting, you can't, it has to be 100%. So you're probably going to do a capture technology and back it up with some sort of PCR to, to fill it in. Uh, the other challenge is that as all these emerging platforms come in, so we get a, a MySeq next week or a week after, uh, and we'll have to validate that to see, make sure that it's, it's usable in this, this, uh, this pipeline. Uh, again, it has that nice, nice uh, advantage of being uh, a rapid turnaround. Big one here is the, the amount of DNA material that goes in. So we've managed to reduce that over the years. Uh, the first protocols for making libraries on Illumina, for example, were 10 micrograms of DNA, and now we can do it with 100 nanograms. So uh, we're getting better at reducing that. And the false negative rate, I talked about that. We want to make sure we get 100% coverage. And the incidental findings here. So uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about more. I'll just pass over that for a second, and we'll talk about that in another slide or two, I think. So part of the whole process is when we get the sample in, we do our analysis. The patients have cancer, and so we want to deal with that first. And that's the, the somatic mutations or, or germline mutations in genes that we know. Uh, like BRCA1 or 2 that are important. Uh, these may be, these will be validated uh, to, to part of the report to the physician. And we meet every week as an expert panel. There's 12 members of that panel, about half uh, clinicians and half uh, genomicists, et cetera, and uh, to discuss this and come up with a report to give back. And we do this within three weeks, and this comes back and to deal with the person's cancer. But as you're sequencing, especially as we increase the number of genes, uh, you're going to find mutations in their germline, which may be important to their overall health or their family's health, but really are irrelevant to the situation they've got cancer right now. And the question is what to do with those. Uh, and that they could be quite important. But again, we have to go through this process of evaluating what we think uh, we're going to pass on. And uh, they need to be validated in a clear lab and then get passed on to the genetic counselors, et cetera, to decide what to do. But this is an interesting problem. And it's, I think this slide gives you an idea of that. As we expand up, if you're sequencing the entire exome, of any individual, you'll find around 75 to 200 genes with deleterious mutations in them. And if you do the whole genome, it's probably like 600 genes. You get better coverage, and you'll find uh, as many. This is a couple, a couple. Uh, this is extracted from the literature. Uh, so you might find, you know, somewhere between 200 and 500 genes that have deleterious mutations in them. So there's a, a we're all carrying a, a very large load of, uh, of 
variants, we'll call them mutations, but variants in genes, some of which could impact our health. Most of which we don't know, have any idea what they do, but some, some we do recognize, and the question is how to report those back. All right, so on to the last thing, which is pharmacogenetics a little bit. Um, so we all, you know, many of us, especially as we get older, we start taking more and more drugs, but uh, you take a drug and uh, the, there's three outcomes of that, really. One is the desired response, which the, we hope we all get. Uh, the other is there's really no effect. You give the drug to the person and it doesn't matter. And in rare cases, then it can actually uh, hurt the patient. Uh, and all of these things are impacted by environmental factors. And a simple one is uh, like uh, uh, grapefruit juice. If you're on many drugs, you're not supposed to eat or drink grapefruit juice because it interferes with the enzymes involved in metabolizing those drugs. Uh, and uh, so that's why you see on many of the labels, you'll see do not uh, take with grapefruit. Uh, and of course, genetic factors. So if the genes themselves, I said all those mutations that we carry, if they're in these genes that uh, affect the metabolism, then clearly uh, that can have an effect. So, and there's it's sort of different. There's pharmacokinetics. There's the absorption, of distribution, metabolism, excretion of it. All of these require biological processes, uh, and the pharmacodynamics of what what the impact on the receptors or what 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 their uh, target is, and whether it's uh, changed or not. I'll give some examples. Uh, uh, well, in a sec. So the the it's actually interesting that the um, the adverse drug reactions ADRs are the fourth leading cause of hospitalization and the fifth leading cause of mortality, and this is U.S. numbers. And it's actually uh, been calculated that the treating these, and they're very, fairly rare, but treating serious adverse drug reactions exceeds the cost of providing the medications themselves. So it's an important area. So the potential of it is, is here where if this is your population and they all have the same diagnosis and you're going to give them a drug, uh, there are some that uh, you would like to be able to recognize here that, are, that don't respond, so you're not helping them, or even worse, they're, they're, they respond, they, you know, it's toxic to them, and you want to treat them with an alternative drug or, or change, at least change the dose of the drug compared to the, the bulk of the population that responds normally. And in clinical trials in cancer, for example, uh, this is sort of the uh, standard profile for clinical trials. You work out the safety of the dosage, and then you'll do a small test and you scale it up. And in this case, we're showing that uh, these are non-responders here, uh, responders and, and hyper-responders, people who may be sensitive to the drug. And your placebo and your control, your case control groups are roughly, hopefully, about the same. But they don't have to always be the same. These are randomly assigned, and, and this distribution may change a bit, which may skew your results. And a better design, if we can do it, if we recognize these, uh, these subgroups, is we can sort of weed out the non-responders up front. Uh, you're not doing them any good on a clinical trial anyways. Uh, and also, you can then have a, a, a more focused uh, phase three trial, which is going to fall faster and, and smaller and, and, and less expensive. All right, some uh, examples here. So the cytochrome P450 2D6, 2D6 uh, is frequently in, in many of the drugs we take, metabolizes those. And uh, many of the drugs uh, go through this pipeline. So 5 to 8% of Caucasians are phenotypically poor metabolizers uh, because of mutations in that gene. And there's 106 alleles so far in that gene. So I'm just a, a simple example is morphine metabolism. So uh, if you want some pain relief, you take some codeine, uh, but it's not the active form. It's actually the morphine, which is the active form, and it goes through CIT, uh, 2D6. And in case where someone is, uh, has a mutation that doesn't metabolize very well, doesn't make this change here, uh, then obviously you're giving them the drug and they're still feeling the pain, so you're not helping them out. But even a more deleterious case is someone who's hyperactive and that enzyme converts it very readily, uh, more than a normal person, so you give them a normal drug, but the amount of morphine then they get is, is, is higher and, and that can actually be toxic. And just to bring it back to cancer, and another example is tamoxifen. Uh, tamoxifen, this is the, the form that's taken, this is the active form that, that in your body goes through uh, several steps, including again CYP, uh, 2D6. Uh, and if you can, in the clinical trials, it's been shown that if you can uh, type people and, and get their, the, uh, whether they're, they're going to metabolize it well or not, uh, and you can uh, subtype those groups and you can get a better outcome. All right, so we mentioned the, the data privacy and security. I think this is the last thing on my list to, to cover. Um, it's really obvious that clinical information needs to be protected. Uh, you know, if you're, you're your patient charts, uh, you don't want other people to see those. So, and that's that's pretty obvious. But what's not so obvious, I think, is the, the great concern now of the next-gen sequencing data. You can produce so much data, 
you know, this, this doesn't operate, apply to things like microarray data, which are expression profiles, but the sequence data and those individual variants are, are like a fingerprint. Uh, and so the, the identity, as you increase that and you get into millions of SNPs, the certainty of a genetic identity become increasingly, uh, uh, you know, positive. So you must adequately protect the data, and probably encryption is the best security. And uh, this, this is a, your, your trade-off between, you, if you can encrypt everything, so if you encrypt your cluster, you'll spend all your horsepower of your cluster will spent encrypting and decry decrypting. Um, so you have to make sure you've got good firewalls, but if you're going to transfer data of any large size, uh, especially you, you want encryption on that. Uh, and I think some of this is growing out of, some of this is, is an overreaction. I think um, people are worried that, uh, you know, insurance companies, especially in the U.S., will trove through the databases and identify you and not give you insurance. Uh, but there was an example, uh, I think it was in 2008, of a, uh, an adopted individual who wanted to find their, their biological father. They had their, some uh, SNP, in one sequence it was SNP typing done on their Y chromosome, were able to search public databases and uh, found th there's a correlation between the variant seen and surnames. And so they were able to get uh, so, so a number of hits in the database that they, they matched near to, and you know something like half of those people had the same last name or a variant thereof. And so they were able to narrow it down. They knew roughly where the, the person who had uh, uh, that uh, donated the, the sperm for that person, they knew roughly where they were from. And using that, they were able to narrow it down to two or three people, and they were actually able to contact and find the person. So by sequencing their own DNA, they were able to track down their, their birth uh, or their biological father. Uh, and so that really, uh, because of that, uh, you know, everything, everything went up and everyone got upset about it and data privacy, which is it's a good thing to be upset about. But uh, it's, uh, you know, you really have to clamp it down and, and make sure that you are in control of your data. Uh, that's being used. And that's why the, I mentioned the ICGC. If you want the germline data, you actually have to apply and get a password to get at that germline data. All right, I think this is my last slide, I believe. Um, you're going to learn a, a lot in this week about how to deal with all these data. So there's all these data types listed here that uh, need to be brought together for any sort of uh, analysis you want to do. Um, you want to collect as much of the data as you can because it's all important. You don't want to restrict yourself just to a single nucleotide variants, for example. Uh, and some of the cancers, that's actually not that important compared to structural variation. Uh, bring them all together, uh, bring them in with the clinical data, and figure out what you want to follow and, and, and do, uh, you know, pull in the pathway. So I think uh, throughout the rest of this week, uh, this is the type of global big picture that I think you'll need to be looking at. I won't put that up yet. <laughs> I still got 15 minutes. So, are there any questions? Any burning questions? And if they'll be answered late in the week, I'll just say they'll be answered late in the week. Yeah. So they 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 do it like four five four. They only put one base in at a time. So if they get a signal, they know that it's an A. If they put an A in at the time. Complicated questions. Um, so heterogeneity. You want, so the question is, how do you deal with heterogeneity, and how do you know the data is real? <laughs> Simple way to put it. Um, so heterogeneity is, is an issue. Uh, it depends on. That's why we like sequence because you can drill down very deep in the sequence, um, and so you're sampling that population, at, you know, at greater depth. Um, the question though, you, you know, how low can you go, right? If you're looking at things that are, you know, one percent of your reads have a variant and the error rate on the machine is 1%. Do you believe it or don't believe it? Uh, if the errors are random, then it's unlikely they're going to pile up in one spot, but we all know the errors aren't random. Uh, they, there are sequence biases that could do that. So uh, typically we don't like being down around the 1% range. Uh, we're pretty comfortable in the 5 or 10% range. We find that those validate very well. On the PacBio, for example, uh, we, we do a 5% cutoff. Uh, anything below 5%, we don't consider real at that point in time. Uh, from a patient treatment standpoint, it's probably not relevant anyways when you've got something that's 85%, right, and you've got one that's 5%. We can actually go lower than 5%. We just start 
around three or four percent, you start finding the background is coming up, and we're we're getting better at dealing with that, uh, being able to filter it out. But uh, right now, it's where so you have to set some kind of cutoff. Um, and again, it's uh, I think uh, we're looking at things that um, typically that, that it, we're not. You could keep going in sequence forever and get down to the 0.1 percent of the cells have this or that. But the question question is, what is the rele relevance uh, to the tumor you're, you're studying? We do, we do. So the question is, do you, do you change it? Uh, if you know the heterogeneity or the, the, the cellularity is what we, we refer to it as, the amount of tumor that's there, then you can adjust it. Right? So if you know it's only 50% tumor that you're sequencing, then you could drop your signal down. A diploid signal would be 50%, at 50% tumor, mm -hmm. your signal would be at 25%. But there's a lot of variation in that. Even in a diploid, um, just sequencing a normal genome where every SNP should be 50-50, in your read count, you see uh, anywhere from 20 to 80 percent in a range like that. So it does vary, and that's just a sampling issue. So the deeper you go, the, the better it is. How many people are working on cell lines versus uh, tissue? Cell lines. <laughs> yeah, you have to get one or the other. <laughs> cell lines. Tissue. Any question? So at some level, like with data emerging, that there is some level of genetic mosaicism uh, in normal cell, so skin versus other. Yeah. How do you choose a normal reference? Like. Typically, it's blood, because that's just easy to get. Right. Um, if uh, you can get adjacent tissue, but there's a field effect, you often find around the tumor move away a little bit. You're still finding some of the early changes in it. So uh, sometimes, you, like the pancreas, sometimes you use a piece of stomach. They remove a small piece of stomach in, in the operation as well. Um, the bigger question is in transcription, you know, transcriptome studies, um, what do you use? And that's a real, real problem. Um, so the pancreatic samples, we're doing transcriptomes on them. But the question is, you know, what do we use for normal? Now, we can get some normal uh, pancreas. So we can get at least get, in the, in the Whipple operation, when they remove the pancreas, they remove most of it anyways. They, they take some distal pieces, and we can use those as our control. But it's very difficult to get the exact cell type. And norm, people don't like to give up normal tissue <laughs> very much. You know, like normal brain is hard to get. Um, so they, you know, sometimes you get it from uh, autopsies. People, you know, donate to, to science, et cetera. But it, that is a real question, and especially in transcriptome, is what is the normal? So that brings the next question, which is when you overlay, like in your pancreatic whole genome sequence, when you overlay the transcriptome analysis, how many of those mutations are actually expressed? Well, that, that's a good. That's one of the. That's a good good question. I mean, the the, the question is, you know, when you're you're overlaying transcriptome data, uh, or if you're looking at, at mutations in, in the DNA, how many of them are expressed, right? So how many are important? And so that's a it's a good piece of the of the puzzle as well. So you sequence the entire genome, you find a bunch of mutations, but you don't know that they're all being. And they look really deleterious and really exciting, but unless that that's actually being expressed, then it. it not going to affect the cell, right? So you, you can overlay those two data sets. Uh, you can look in the transcriptome data. You can actually call SNPs in the transcriptome data. It's rather it's fairly difficult actually to get good SNP calls. Partly that's because of the variation. Uh, you you, you see in the genome it's normalized, but in the in the transcriptome data it's all over the place, and so it's really hard to call SNPs. You tend to overcall quite a bit. But uh, you could see if you know a mutation that's in the in the DNA, you could go look in the transcriptome specifically and make sure that which allele is being expressed and might find that the deleterious one is not even being expressed at that point. Or it might be expressed and just degraded very quickly. So that these are not meant to give answers, really, these studies. They're meant to point you to leads that you do more studies on. So would you then think that it's sort of essential for all the No, not necessarily, I don't think, because um, if you're doing a large number, I guess the question for the recording is, uh, whether or not uh, you know transcriptome is an essential thing to be doing all the time. Um, the one one thing we're doing is doing a lot of sequencing, um, you know, large numbers of tumors. So if you see a recurrent mutation, it would be kind of surprising if that wasn't important and wasn't being expressed. But regardless, whatever you find, you have to follow up on. So these recurrent mutations, we would then go back and uh, look for expression. Now whether you need to do a whole transcriptome or you can just do targeted qPCR. And, and ask whether it, it, that specific one's expressed. But it, the more information you have, the better.
but they'll cost. Do you see a future for protein work? Future of protein work, yes. <laughs> so uh, proteomics is very important. Um, proteomics is come a long way, but it's still you still can't take a cell and, or you know a population cell like a tumor, stick it in uh, mass spec, and come out with a spectrum of all the proteins. You're really only looking at the top uh, few that you can identify, or top thousand or something. Um, you know, of a million proteins, you can probably only assay a thousand. I'm not a proteomics person, so I'm kind of making these numbers up. But it's kind of what I hear. Um, but so that's the problem. Is but if you can ask, you can ask specific questions. So again, you can say, um, you know, I've seen this mutation even in the transcriptome. The next question is, does it doesn't make a protein, right? You know, you might see it in the in the RNA, but you don't know that it actually gets all the way to a protein. Uh, and so that you can specifically go in and look for that specific protein and ask, is that mutated one actually being expressed as a protein? Do you have any comments about the You know, I was looking at that. I was, I was on vacation last week, and I tried to actually take a vacation. Um, but I did have, I was looking at some of those papers, and I haven't quite formulated an opinion yet. There's a recent one that says, I think they found 10,000 or something. Yeah. So uh, comparing uh, transcriptome to DNA, there's like tens of thousands or 10,000, at least thousands of differences between the transcriptome and the DNA. Now they did do some proteomics, and uh, what I didn't get to, because I was on vacation, but the depth of reading was how many they did and what the validation rate was. But they did do proteomics and show that some of those are being expressed as, uh, uh, you know, as an altered protein. So if that's true, then it really adds another layer of complexity right, that we have to take into account. And, and there may be signatures in there that you start being able to predict which ones are, are going to be altered. but. Uh, uh, the sort of the, the wisdom before was that it's a rare event, but this this one, these recent papers make it seem that it's not so rare, and it's something that we really do have to consider. So I haven't formulated a full opinion on that yet. What do you think? I, I read some critiques on that paper that sort of could explain it by a number of different types of artifacts. Yeah. So, so not all of them, but many of them. So the right. numbers are not made up. Yeah, that was my feeling as well, is that it's a significant event, but not as prevalent as likely they're trying to imply. Question over here. In experience, uh, one of the best uh, validation techniques that people uh, perform analysis. For sequence? Um, that depends on the level of what you're trying to detect. So um, the gold standard has always been Sanger-based sequencing. But for germline mutation, that's fine, because uh, you're, you're seeing 50-50 alleles, and so it's very easy to validate. In cancer, it can be quite difficult. If your primary tumor only has 10 or 15 percent, I had one that was, I was given the DNA, I didn't see the tumor, and it was it turned out, you can tell by the sequence that it's only 5 percent tumor DNA in there. So you do a Sanger read, and you know, you can see a little tiny bump, and it was a really beautiful Sanger read, it was clean, it was the only little bump in the whole trace. But you know, you could never call that without knowing that that was already there. So Sanger is the gold standard, um, but uh, for cancer, people are doing more uh, targeted sequencing, like, uh, so take your amplicon and sequence it several hundred fold deep, uh, and common one has been the 454 platform, if people have that. We've been using the PacBio, because we don't have a 454. Um, the MySeq will probably be a good platform for that as well. So you want, you want to, and, and uh, maybe the ion torrent, you want to take it to another technology, you don't want to really use Illumina sequencing to validate Illumina. Um, so you want to take another technology, but you want something that's more targeted and focused uh, and relatively cheap. But you want to go deep in cancer. You mentioned uh, sequencing single molecules. Do you have any reason to admit that wasn't a big contaminant by normal? Have you actually tried to sequence single cells? We haven't tried to sequence single cells. Um, there, There's papers out that people have done transcriptomes and they're starting to do I used to think the holy grail was to do single cells, but um, I think that you can't tell the difference between biological variation and technical variation at that point. So you're probably going to average together 10 cells or more anyway, so you might as well sequence 10 cells, is my opinion. Um, but we haven't pushed it to that limit, and part of it is the you have to do a lot of amplification to get enough material to input into these things right now. Um, the PacBio is single molecule, but you 
you start out with a fair amount of DNA to get to the get enough to put on the machine. You, there's quite a bit of loss. Uh, we're getting better. There's less loss throughout the whole process. But um, it's like we started with 10 micrograms of DNA for a library. We're down to 100 nanograms. So those technologies are coming. We're trying to push those two from place. We like using laser capture, right, and just pulling out specific cell types and sequencing them. Maybe not single, but you know, getting a nice clean separation of the stroma and the tumor. Um, so we're trying to get the, bring the the two together, the, the high throughput sequencing and those types of technologies so they can meet in the middle. Um, we're not quite there, but we're getting closer. Uh, the prostate uh, project we're just starting, uh, I always sign up for these projects without knowing everything. And then they, we go to do it, and they want a whole genome sequence, and they can give me 100 nanograms of DNA, and they want all the analysis done. So we had to stop and, and work on that. So we're always trying to drive that input down. No, I think you can do frozen. Yeah. I don't have a lot of experience with laser capturing it. it the pathologists don't like to do you know, histology on frozen. It doesn't give nice clean sections, but you can get enough to get laser capture. 